assumption number four is that they're plentiful substitutes for oil. However, we've got a series of reality checks. Coal is really polluting, not least in terms of carbon dioxide emissions, and what's more, it's another finite resource, and some studies suggest that annual production of coal could peak as early as 2011. Natural gas is required for generating electricity, making fertilizers, and heating homes, and for cooking with. And its supplies, again finite, will reach a peak and decline within the next couple of decades. So it can't fully replace oil. Biofuels threaten water and food security because most of the biofuels currently take food crops and large amounts of water and turn them into liquid fuels. Biofuels also threaten the destruction of forests in countries like Malaysia and Indonesia where they're planting palm oil trees. Nuclear electricity, as we've seen recently in Japan, is inherently risky. Also, uranium supplies are limited and production of uranium might reach a peak by 2020. The energy return on energy invested of most of the substitutes for oil is much lower than the historical return on investment for oil. So although there are lots of alternative energy sources, none of them fully compares to oil in terms of its versatility and utility. Assumption number five is that markets will solve the problem through adjustments to consumption. We'll simply use less fuel as the price rises. Reality check five. Economic growth and oil consumption have always been tightly coupled together. Demand is still surging in developing countries despite the rapid increase in prices that we've seen in the last few years. In China alone, consumption has increased by several million barrels per day over the last few years and shows no signs of abating. Assumption number six is that technology will rescue us. High oil prices quickly stimulate inventions and the hydrogen economy is just around the corner. Reality check number six. Mitigation takes time. It takes many years to invest and build the new energy infrastructure and transport infrastructure that we'll need to wean ourselves off oil. Hydrogen is an energy carrier, not a source of energy, and is actually a very inefficient energy carrier, less so than electricity. Reality checkmate. In the contest between assumptions and reality, reality always wins. We'll look now at the global implications of peak oil. The first thing to note is that this is an unprecedented phenomenon. The world has never experienced something like the peaking of its most important energy supply before. However, we can look at history to get a fairly good idea about what to expect, for instance in looking at the 1970s oil shocks. Developing countries in particular are very vulnerable to higher oil prices. History has clearly shown that oil price spikes trigger economic recessions in the major countries like the United States and indeed in the global economy. This was the case in 1973, 79, 1990 and again in 2008. So what does this mean about the future path of the global economy? Well, if oil consumption and economic growth remain tightly coupled, then when oil supplies start declining, on the backside of the oil peak, the world economy will be contracting year after year. What's more, there could be sudden constrictions in oil supply, for instance because of geopolitical events. We know that around two-thirds of remaining oil reserves lie in the volatile Middle East. Now we'll have a look at South Africa's energy situation. The energy mix in South Africa is dominated by coal, which provides over 70% of primary energy supply. Oil contributes about 12%. Wood, waste and other biomass resources provide less than 10%. And renewables like solar and wind are absolutely negligible at this stage. 70% of South Africa's oil supply is provided by imports. About 23% comes from Sassel's coal-to-liquids synth fuels 
and the other remaining 7% from Petro SA is gas to liquids. Over 90% of our imports are derived from OPEC countries, making us very vulnerable. In South Africa, as in the world, oil consumption is tightly coupled to gross domestic product. Over the past few years, our country has seen a steep rise in oil import bill, the amount of money that we have to spend on importing oil. In 2008, when the oil price spiked, about 6% of GDP was spent on oil. And around that proportion, it seems to trigger an economic recession. So what are the implications for South Africa of declining global oil supplies? In the first place, we'll see a continued rise in the prices of petrol and diesel, as we've witnessed over the past few years. Where might petrol prices be going? Well, if the exchange rate remained at 7 rand to the dollar, and oil prices went to $200 a barrel, which many analysts see as feasible within the next couple of years, then the petrol price would be at about 13 rand 50 per litre. If the exchange rate depreciated to around 10 to the dollar, which it's done in past uh, oil shock scenarios, then we'd be looking at over 17 rand per litre for petrol and diesel. So the challenges for South Africa are shortages of fuel, rising costs of living, growing unemployment, economic recession, declining trade and tourism, growing food insecurity as food prices rise, and the potential for social instability. We're going to have to be very inventive about the way that we use our old technology. But it's not all bad news. Less can definitely be more. Less oil means less pollution, less traffic congestion, fewer road accidents and deaths, opportunities for local economies to grow, and potential for greater interdependency.